When God said clean or unclean, what exactly did he mean? What was he talking about? Good morning, my name is Rod Hembrick. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study, a program designed to take you through the Bible in one year, from Genesis to Revelation 22, and we do that with a great deal of excitement. Get your Bibles ready and get your pocket guide ready because today on the program we're going to talk about clean and unclean animals that are mentioned in the Bible for eating. What does it mean? We'll talk about that and more as we move along here, but first Corey's telling us what she's doing today. Corey? Today we are going to be discussing ancient purification rituals as well as taking a look at an ancient healthcare system. And Ryan is talking about did God really say, Ryan? Today we're going to be exploring a supposed error in the book of Leviticus. And here's the question. Did Moses call a bat a bird? I hope you join me for that one. Did Moses call a bat a bird? What a great question. Mm -hmm. We'll explore that today. You have what for us? We're going to talk about some of the details concerning the laws around leprosy. The laws around leprosy. So get your Bible out, get your Bible guide out, and study with us as we move along on Quick Study Television. Many people find the book of Leviticus and even Numbers and Deuteronomy rather dry because they get into a lot of technical details of the law. Um, but there are many interesting images that are placed here. They're like little buried treasures. And if you just take time to read it, you'll see what I mean. Right now, we're going to be focusing in on just one of these treasures from the book of Leviticus. We're gonna be talking about the water of cleansing and the symbolism around it. Numbers chapter 19 outlines the procedure for creating the water of cleansing. Normally, contact with any dead thing would make an Israelite ritually unclean for seven days. But this water of cleansing required to make the people clean itself contained the ashes of a burnt red heifer, something dead. This cow, rare in itself, had to be without blemish and never used for work. It was burned unusually outside of the camp with cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet wool. Even more unusual, the heifer's blood and waste were burned with it, an otherwise unallowed practice. Also, the men involved in sacrificing and mixing the heifer with water became impure in the act Yet the water was then used to cleanse them on the third and seventh days. When examined, this sacrifice of the red heifer is strikingly similar to the execution of Jesus Christ. He, who claimed to bear all the sin of humanity, was crucified outside of Jerusalem. He rose again on the third day, and promises that all who accept him as savior are cleansed, their sins paid for by he himself. There are so many more interesting symbols that, uh, that can be found within the book of Leviticus. So as you're reading through, do yourself a favor and see if you can find any and link that with other parts of scripture that you've already read, both back in Genesis and even in the New Testament as well. Now, a little bit later on in the program, you and I are going to be getting into medical texts, actual medical textbooks from the ancient world, from before the time period of Moses and also contemporary and a little bit after Moses as well. Now, the point in doing this is to put in context ancient thought and how the Hebrews would have understood medicine in the first place. And it might surprise you how advanced this kind of thinking really is. And it takes more of a holistic approach with looking both at the physical implications of a sickness and also the spiritual implications of a sickness. So please stick around. We're going to get into that a little bit later.
The idea of clean and unclean food is strange to us today. Many in the world have all kinds of things that they eat and other parts of the world that they do not. Now the Hebrew faith is one that has clean and unclean foods that they practice today. Where does this wisdom come from? We read today in the interesting manifestation of clean versus unclean foods. What is clean and why? What is unclean and why? These questions are answered in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 11 helps us bring clean and unclean things into clear view. Many doctors and physicians have played the part in capturing the wisdom of clean food. Let's explore. Leviticus 11, verses 1 through 12. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those that chew the cud or those that have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud but does not have cloven hooves, is unclean to you. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. These you may eat of all that are in the water. Whatever in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the rivers, that you may eat. But all in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water, or any living thing which is in the water, they are an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Whatever in the water does not have fins or scales, that shall be an abomination to you. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Thank you for staying with us. This, of course, is Bible Discovery TV, and I'm Rod Hembry, and we are going through the book of Leviticus. What an interesting book this is. As we explore the book, we're in chapter 11 today, and we introduce a subject of clean and unclean foods. Now that's a strange subject, isn't it? Really interesting. So as we look at our review, we're going to study this and understand what is God trying to say with this clean and unclean food business. Now I should remind you that the clean and the unclean food also occurred on the Ark of Noah, which happened many years before this. So this is an interesting move. Now here in the review is the following. Wisdom in eating. That's a good one. And our reading is Leviticus chapter 11 through 13 with our focus on Leviticus chapter 11 verses 1 through 12. In this passage, it spe specifically speaks of two kinds of food and uh, it identifies what they are and why. And it says, well, these foods are clean and these foods are unclean. Now that is interesting to me, especially since in Egypt you pretty much ate anything that moved. It's very interesting. All right, so let's move on to the first passage of Scripture in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 1. And the Bible says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, and he said to them, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all of the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, that you may eat. Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? It brings me to our first animal point. The animal that divides the hoof 
and choose the cod is clean, a clean animal and acceptable for Hebrews to eat. This is good. Now, whoever thought of that idea, whoever thought of, uh, you know, the hoof being divided and all of that business, that's an interesting point. But Jesus Christ and God the Father was explaining to the people of Israel through Moses and Aaron, this is the animal which is clean. And so you look at their hooves and you look at what they chew and you begin to understand and make a difference between what animal is good to eat and what animal is not good to eat. That is fascinating. And so as we look at that, we begin to understand and we go on to the next scripture, which is in Leviticus 11, chapter 11, verse 4. And it says, nevertheless, these you shall not eat among those who chew the cud or those who have cloven hooves. The camel, because it chews the cud, but it does not have cloven hooves, it's unclean to you. Don't eat the camel. The rock hyrax, because it chews the cud, but it does not have cloven hooves. This is unclean to you. The hare, because it chews the cud, but does not have cloven hooves. It is unclean to you. And the swine, the pigs, for example, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet it does not chew the cud. This is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Wow, that's important. And it brings us to our next point. The animals that are unclean are those animals that we should not eat. They're bad for us. Now, this is important. I'm, now, you need to stay with me here because I'm going to come up on something at the end which will help you understand this. But in this Jewish law, God makes sure to mention which animals are clean and which animals are unclean, what you can eat, what you cannot eat. And he actually says it in the Bible. And he says, here is what it is. Now, that's different than many other religions of that time. Now, let's quickly go on to the next passage in verse 9. This is 11, verse 9. These you may eat all that are in the water. In other words, what can you eat in the water? Well, this is what it says. Whatever is in the water has fins and scales, whether in the seas or the rivers. You may eat that. That's interesting. So anything that has fins and scales, that brings me to the next point. The animals that are clean are in the water, and those that have fins and scales are in the water. So here we have something that is interesting. Things like lobster and things like crab and all that are technically unclean. Why is that? Could be a lot of reasons, but we know that many of the things with fins on them, uh, are, they don't uh, feed on stuff at the bottom of the sea, where these other things that have external skeletons on them feed on all of the things at the bottom of the sea. That's one practical example that you hear from doctors. Many doctors talk about this. And then there's the unclean animals like the pigs, for example. Well, that wipes out your bacon, doesn't it? Well, all of these things are designed in the book of Leviticus as the Mosaic law or the Jewish law. Now, this is important because you need to hear me now. I'm going to explain this so everybody understands. Because Jesus Christ was actually fulfillment of the Jewish law, we understand that we are not under the obligations of this clean and unclean food. That is important for you to understand. It's important for me to understand, beloved, that we don't run around saying, well, I eat this or I don't eat that, therefore I'm clean and unclean. Now listen to me careful. There are people who are Jewish in background and they feel like they need to abide by these Jewish laws. Well, you know, that's okay. But the truth is that salvation in Jesus Christ does not require you to fulfill the Jewish laws. Now that is true for most of the laws. And there is in Acts chapter 15, there are four requisites that you can look at, and he went through this, and you can understand for salvation to come, you need to stay with these things. This is important. And so when you look at Acts chapter 15, you begin to see that. But the Jewish laws of clean and unclean food help us to set up what comes in the future and what is a part of sin and not sin. This is fascinating stuff. So I have to leave it here, but stay with us on the program as we continue to study on in the book of Leviticus.
Now, hopefully you've noticed as you're reading through with us the book of Leviticus from the Old Testament of the Bible, that many of the laws and regulations actually have to do with healthcare. Now, this is really interesting when you put it into perspective of the cultural context. So when you take a look at the other cultures that were around Israel at that same time and take a look at where their healthcare was, it proves a very interesting study. So right now, you and I are going to be exploring ancient medical textbooks. There have been many medical tablets discovered from the ancient world. These tablets span thousands of years and numerous cultures. Some seem to be very physical in their remedies, prescribing various concoctions, herbs, and plants, some of which are still used by modern medicine. Other tablets place a heavy emphasis on the spiritual, emotional side of illness, prescribing sacrifices to certain gods and rituals for expulsion of evil spirits or to cancel a spell. Generally, there appears to have been both a physical and spiritual element to the ancient approach to health care. It was recognized that some illnesses involved the spiritual world, while others were purely physical. In some places, there were even separate doctors to consult, depending on the spiritual or physical diagnosis. Some researchers claim that the Bible shares this view. The Levitical codes dealing with cleanliness and disease seem very practical and physical. Yet, there are some scriptures in which sickness is clearly brought on or reversed by God for a specific purpose and still others that suggest demon-influenced illness. What are we to make of this? It does appear that the Bible presents sickness as sometimes physical and other times involving the spiritual world. The difference comes in whom you're supposed to go to. Physical remedies are one thing, but God alone is the complete healer in the Bible. Chasing after the pagan demon gods was denounced as adultery. By bowing to them, a person would become enslaved to them. The world is complicated, but in the Bible, the answer is not. Reconciliation with God is the only route to peace. With all the religions of the world claiming to possess an element of holiness or being holy, what does that mean? What is holy? Is it possible for anything to become redeemed or holy? The first three times the word holy is used in the Bible is Exodus 3.5, Exodus 12.16, and Exodus 15. The Torah or the Jewish law puts holiness into context. But what does that mean? your copy of the one-hour DVD on holiness answering these questions and much more featuring Rod and Janice Hembry, Corey Babetsko, write to us. And when you write, consider an offering of $25 or more for the one-hour DVD on holiness. You can write to the online version of holiness by going to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and you can watch it on internet video after you give. When you write, remember that our support is exclusively from you. Send your gift to P.O. Box 150, Marysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada, P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Or go to Safe Online Giving at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television as we go through the Bible in one year from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation 22. It's a mm -hmm. very interesting journey as we do that. Next time on Quick Study Television, we are going to look at the cost of sin. It is death. Jesus Christ paid the cost of sin and gave us new life. We'll explore 
what that means and how that works in the gospel of Jesus Christ, all from the Old Testament. I think you'll find that very interesting. But right now we have Ryan Hembry here with What Did God Say? Moses, who is the author of the first five books of the Bible, has been attacked over and over by critics. Now, this is because they seek to disprove that Moses was getting his information from God. Now, one of these attacks focuses on Leviticus chapter 11, where Moses, who is well-educated in Egyptian curriculum, seems to call a bat a bird. Well, let's explore this passage. Skeptics of the Bible accuse the scriptures of being littered with contradictions and errors and claim that it is really not the Word of God. Skepticism has risen so fast that it has actually become an epidemic in our modern culture. This is a result of thousands of years of Satan, who is called the father of lies in John 8.44, putting doubts in the minds of mankind. This deception can be traced back all the way to the Garden of Eden when Satan, while tempting Eve, questioned God's words. Did God really say? In a similar fashion, the father of lies has created doubt in many people's minds about the human authors of the Bible, and if God was really speaking through them. Moses, for example, who authored the first five books of the Bible, has been attacked many times. For example, some claim that there is an alleged error in Leviticus 11, 13 to 19. The passage reads, And these you shall regard as an abomination among the birds. They shall not be eaten, they are an abomination. The eagle, the vulture, the buzzard, the kite and the falcon after its kind, every raven after its kind, the ostrich, the short-eared owl, the seagull and the hawk after its kind, the little owl, the fisher owl and the screech owl, the white owl, the jackdaw and the carrion vulture, the stork, the heron after its kind, the hoopoe and the bat. The accusation here is that Moses wrongly calls a bat a bird. However, in examining the original Hebrew translation of this passage, we find that the Hebrew word that has been translated as bird is alf, which actually means fowl or winged creature, or to fly, or has a wing. This means that while the Hebrew word does include birds, it is not limited to it. In fact, it could include birds, bats, and even flying insects. This then is simply a mistranslation in the English Bible and is not an error in the original biblical manuscripts. So we see here that the English translators merely mistranslated and limited the Hebrew word auf to bird, but in actuality the Hebrew word means fowl or wind creature, or to fly or has a wing. Therefore a better translation of this passage might be the following, and these you shall regard as an abomination among the winged creatures. Here again we see that this is simply a translational issue and that there is no error in the original biblical manuscripts. No error in the original <laughs> biblical manuscript. That's very important. Thank you, Ryan. What a great report mm -hmm. that is. Uh, it is excellent. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study. What do you have for the Bible discovery question? Well, our Bible discovery point, uh, point. Our reading today, our assignment, viewers, was Leviticus chapters 11 through 13. I focused in on Leviticus 13, verse 45. We're talking about the laws concerning leprosy and those who have been diagnosed with it. This verse says, Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean, unclean. So covering his mustache, I thought, well, that's a curious way of saying things in this day and age. Now, some translations that you may have could say upper lip rather than cover his mustache, and that's regarding the lip beard or where your mustache would be if you're a man. Yeah, right here, right here. So the yeah. Hebrews held the beard in very high regard as a mark of manliness, so to cover the lip, and by doing so, you're concealing the beard growing there, that was a sign of sorrow and mourning. And if we want to compare that with other scripture, in Micah 3, verse 7, Micah represents the prophets as mourning, because God refuses to reveal himself to them, and he says they shall all cover their lips. All right, so there, what do you think about that? They would have to cover it and, and say unclean, unclean. They're unclean. How's mm -hmm. that, Corey? Does that work for you? <laughs> you? You like the covering? Yeah, that would be unfortunate for sure. <laughs> all right, so we're not going to do that, but that is interesting. Mm -hmm. Very good. And I, we just have a few seconds. I want to remind you that you can 
Watch the website at BibleDiscoveryTV.com. We've got it on the screen for you. And when you watch it, you can actually see the programs, and you can see many programs, Hot Flash and some of the others, when you go there. And you can also take a look at Ryan's courses and Corey's courses on Bible Discovery Seminary. So make sure that you go to Bible Discovery TV and see the courses. We can eat whatever we want, but the truth is that some of it is not good for us and may even be poison. The clean animal element is a fascinating journey in zoology creatures that we are meant to eat. Remember that man never even ate meat until after the flood in Genesis 9. Today we can eat anything, but some of the things are dangerous to eat. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law and made right the things that we can eat. But the Jewish faith is a part of the Christian faith. It is good to pay attention to the Hebrews' eating plan and take close note of how they eat. Eating clean foods will make us better for living, but will do nothing for us spiritually. It is a good thing to listen to the Old Testament and consider what things are clean and what things are unclean. In this last minute of the television program, I want to tell you about somebody who brought this program to you. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of Lords and he is the King of Kings. 2,000 years ago, he came, he died on the cross. He was tortured for sin, but he rose again on the third day. And he chose you, but you must choose him. Come to Jesus Christ today. Choose him as your Lord and Savior. Oh. <laughs>